As if they don't have too much on their plates The Kings of Combat Sports Podcast, John and Wade They'll talk about the things they did that day They'll analyze the work of Vince and Triple H Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Rewind to Smackdown Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rewind to SmackDown. I am John Pollock, along with Wei Ting. It is Tuesday night. Exciting times in the world. How are you, Wei? Doing very well, John. Doing very well. Before we begin the show, I think I want to perhaps address the start of yesterday's show. The thing that I think uh, had a lot of people talking this morning. and um, The prize giveaway? <laughs> Yes, congratulations to Brian Simons. No, it was our, our uh, three-minute basketball discussion that I think perhaps derailed into maybe something that felt like anything but a basketball discussion. But um, I guess I just wanted to basically reiterate some of the things that I said uh, on the message board. I wrote a whole thing about it. Um, I did not really intend to, but um, it just kind of became a bit of a thing amongst a very small amount of people. But um, anyway, I don't even know. This is weird. Should we even? Should I even talk about this? It's 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 up to you. I I don't think you have to explain anything. I I didn't think twice about it, so I was kind of surprised it was uh, as discussed as it was. Yeah, uh, but uh, basically. We talked about the Raptors basketball game yesterday, and John had an opinion about the game, which I disagreed with, and I guess in the discussion, I became... And you're allowed to disagree, and you're allowed to voice it however you'd like, and I don't think that we have to worry about how we address one another. That's my two cents. On the on the basketball, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Anyway... So this thing basically kind of turned into a bit of frustration, and I reacted in a sarcastic manner that I probably shouldn't have. And um, it seemed to perhaps escalate the situation and made it even more awkward for everybody. So here I am trying to make it even more (laughs) awkward for everybody else. But in in doing that, I'd also like to apologize um, if I did make things a little bit uh, uncomfortable and... uh, if I offended you in any, any way, John. <laughs> you definitely did not offend me at all. I thought I enjoyed our show last night. I didn't think it was – that's fine. Like I'm uh, I'm completely fine. Whatever, uh, whatever version of waiting I get, I enjoy. Well, that's great. And I did give my prediction at the end. Yeah, everyone got a got a nice. Uh, I thought I thought that was a nice way to to end the show. I thought it was a nice little payoff for those that uh, reached the end. So, if you somehow were able to get past. Those three minutes. There were a hundred that followed it. So let's put everything into perspective. That would be my advice. You know what I've been doing lately, Way? What's that? Yoga. Oh. What kind? I think it's... I've just been like watching different videos and like doing like different uh, stretching routines and stuff. I've got to say, just like a couple days into it, I feel fantastic. Well, that's wonderful, man. That's great. I think it's a great thing to build into any morning. Are you like downward dogging? Upward dogging. I th- th- there is some downward dogging that has been involved. I it, it all started with like this. Uh, I was reading about this thing about being able to do the splits, and while that's not really my my goal in all of this, I, I think it's uh it's kind of something that y- you can work towards. I just want to improve my flexibility a bit because when I did jujitsu, I was hardly the strongest person. I was hardly the most technical or the 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 best. Uh, jiu-jitsu practitioner but my flexibility was pretty good so that that's my one thing i like hung my hat on and i just felt uh especially of late just like a lot of soreness a lot of just like um my muscles have been tighter so i've just wanted to be doing something proactive about it and i've been having a lot of fun with this that's really cool man that's awesome there's a great yeah. yoga yoga studio near my house maybe you should check out actually near your place too is a great one. I'm considering like doing like an actual class because I've just been doing all this stuff on my own. Um, maybe I will uh, attend a class or two. Yeah, it's it's awesome, and I think we're lucky enough to have jobs where we can you know take an, uh, a few minutes out of our day to do a bit of stretching if we needed to. 
So highly recommend it. Namaste, everybody. Uh, yes, from Namaste to New Day. Yeah, it sounded it sounded nice. good in, in execution. Uh, let us go into uh, what is going on in the world. Where would you like to start? Way do you want to start with news? Uh, yeah, sure. Let's do that. All right. Uh, actually, this is a uh, late breaking news. As we're speaking right now, two hundred five live is going on, and Chad Gable was on Tuesday night's two hundred five live, taking on Jack Gallagher. So actually, wrestling. Not doing. Yeah, act, actually wrestling. Not taking any notes. Uh, he was like doing doing our gimmick on SmackDown tonight. But yeah, he's on two hundred five live. I would assume this is probably a permanent change for him to be on two hundred five live. Which I mean, given where that guy's gone into hiding since the Bobby Roode breakup, I mean, it's better than nothing for him. Uh, I agree. Yeah, it's interesting though that he seems to be on both SmackDown and two hundred five live. This episode of SmackDown was a bit of a tease of a new character he was doing. So is it a character that will jump between brands or will he be like a Drake, Ma- Drake Maverick where he'll only talk on SmackDown but wrestle on 205 Live? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, they have been teasing uh, – I think at the house shows, they've been doing a team with Apollo Crews and Chad Gable. So that's who he had the interaction with on SmackDown. So we'll see if he still has a character on SmackDown. But, I mean, at least on 205 Live, he can have some – uh, some matches and I, I I've heard about some like uh some like loose details about t- some changes at 205 live they are trying to do a bit more kind of stories and uh continuity on 205 live so we'll see if that show reflects any changes um coming out of this and yeah how permanent Chad Gable is because at least he is with some guys that he could have some great matches with I think he's a criminally underrated performer underutilized performer in wwe absolutely i agree um i just hope he you know doesn't get completely lost on 205 live because it could be a bit of an island uh some other items uh that are going on we had the raw number from monday and it did turn out to be the lowest of the year not as low as Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve. That was the the bare silver lining. They did 2,125,000 viewers on the USA Network. Going up against the Raptors-Warriors game that did 18,217,000 viewers in the U.S. So a monstrous game. And they did not go against the basketball game in the first hour. And the number pretty much plummeted as soon as the game started. They went from... 2.38 million all the way down to 2,086,000 in the second hour and then fell to 1,910,000 in the third hour. I, I don't put a ton into this number going against such a gigantic basketball game. I think the real question is now that basketball's over, hockey's over, what is going to be their average throughout the summer? Like what are, what are we looking at? Will there be people tuning in now? What kind of bounce back are they going to receive next week? I think that's what we look at and what they can expect for the summer. Yeah, 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 absolutely. They have a at least a, a bit of clear time uh, until football kicks in. Yeah, until September. So, and then we'll see what happens then. And once football comes back, it's a month until the big move to Fox, and that's going to be probably the most uh, discussed series of numbers for Smack SmackDown once they make that move. Uh, what else do we have at here? Ric Flair, all over the news here. He was on Busted Open Radio talking about his myriad health issues, including his four surgeries he's had over the last little while. The fourth one being the one the week of StarCast that ended up taking him out. And he explained that for the fourth operation, he was having problems breathing. Uh, he couldn't even walk 10 steps and had to be taken to the hospital. And the surgery was initially set for the Friday, uh, which was the week before StarCast and got postponed until the Monday because there was a blood clot in his leg that had broken off and gone into his lung. And there had also been fluid on his heart from the anesthesia from the previous three operations. And so he talked about all of that coming out of the, that whole experience and also his decision that he is going to drink alcohol and not feel guilty about it. He said he had been having anxiety before about what one drink would do to him, and he believes that his major issues from 2017 were not caused by alcohol, and he says, I'm going to be Ric Flair, and that is that is his goal. And 
coming off of that is also this potential lawsuit that he's facing after. Did you happen to see this video that got put up last week where he talked about his former manager? It was up very briefly. I did not see that. No. Yeah. So anyway, he in this video he posted to YouTube last week, he talked about his former manager, Melinda Zanani, who he alleges embezzled money, uh, almost allowed several of his trademarks to expire and then had funds stolen from him. So he ended up taking the video down. And then in response, um, her talent agency has put out this message that they have taken the first step and filed a civil lawsuit against Ric Flair and certain unnamed defendants for defamation and said that taking the video down is not enough. And they will vigorously use the court system to protect their good names and reputations and obtain damages due to Ric Flair's defamatory comments contained in the video. So my God, this man, this is way, this is way too much drama for someone that has been through all that Ric Flair has. And my God, to have to go through a potential court battle here over like a stupid video you posted. It's just, man, I don't know. I wonder what his mindset is, you know, to be, I guess, you know, on this close to, to death uh, again. Um, it, it almost feels like he's got a, a list of vendettas or a bunch of things he wants to accomplish. Um, now that he's kind of got this renewed life and I guess maybe some of it is, I don't know, suing as, his enemy. bad. Yeah, as bad as all the health stuff was that he outlined in that busted open radio show, the line that gave me the most pause, and I was like, Rick, please don't. He's like, I'm starting to figure out all this social media stuff. And I was like, oh, no, it's don't get into this, Rick. And he said that he got really upset about all the stuff Becky Lynch was saying about Edge. Have you been following their back and forth? Yes, I have. Yes. So he called up Edge and he was like upset. And he was like, is this a work? And Edge told him, yes, it's a work, Rick. <laughs> and then Bubba goes, well, you exposed that one, Rick. <laughs> He's, <laughs> It's like, Rick, please, please don't go down the social media path. It, it's just – it's going to lead to nothing. Nothing but bad. I mean just just he's dipped his toe into YouTube and he's already got a lawsuit he's facing. Oh, man. For his sake, I, I hope he does a whole lot less of that and maybe a whole lot more of you know spending quality time with, with the people around him. Um, and he looks like he's keeping very busy. He said for, um, potential like endorsements and commercials, he said that he's got to be, he kind of like alluded to the fact he put these videos out to show everybody that he's still energized. He's still Ric Flair. He's not riddled with all these health problems. Like he almost said, like, he's kind of just trying, like it's for, to, to get commercial opportunities and to get like speaking engagements. Like he thinks people are maybe shy of, uh, contacting him because they think he's in poor health. Like that seems to be his his idea is like just getting out there and working. Hmm. So. Yeah. Um. Interesting. Interesting that he's so fueled to you know continue being Ric Flair. Well, that is it. Um. Access TV has also announced that uh, starting with uh, in July. They're going to be broadcasting the first night of the G1 from Dallas live. And then from that week on, they're moving New Japan from Friday nights to Saturday nights. And on the nights when there's a G1 on the Saturday, they'll be turning around those episodes the same day to air them Saturday night. So it means a shift to a, a new night. And uh, that means that New Japan on access will be going against uh, – I believe they'll be in the same time slot as MLW, if I'm not mistaken. It might be they, – they may not actually be head-to-head. -head, but anyway, moving to Saturday nights, and that's a very quick turnaround for those G1s on the Saturdays. So, I mean, they've gone from it being like months out of date to now they're almost within hours of getting those broadcasts up and just using the English commentators from New Japan World. Yeah, and you can hear Kelly start to, you know – produce himself uh, as far as you know commercial breaks and all that as he's calling the new japan world commentary as well so no doubt that makes things far easier on everybody's end not his but um accesses right. yeah i find that that would be really tricky to be calling the shows and having it in mind that this also has to be cut up for a one-hour broadcast as well oh yeah Oh yeah, you know it's you know a lot of it's it's just kind of like waiting for them to do the 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 spot to the floor, and just kind of that whole thing. But I, I imagine some of it is is up to the editor as well, perhaps. 
Also, uh, this weekend, the there's going to be the Sunday and Monday Kazuna Road Shows from Core Q and Hall, and they're going to be called by Mavs Gillis, who was just on Cruel Summer this past weekend with WH Park, and Chris Charlton. The two of them are going to be calling those shows. Just the two. Wow. Yes. I believe Kevin Kelly's back here, and then I presume he'll be then uh, doing Dallas and then probably going over there for the whole G1, I'd assume. Very cool. Yes. What do you think about Gina Davis being cast for the third season of Glow? I think that's awesome. Yeah. Sandy Devereaux St. Clair is her character. And just looking at like the stills that they put out in the little teaser, got a very uh, Dixie Carter vibe. I haven't seen it yet, but um, I think she's perfect for this particular show. It's a name that you haven't really heard of too much. At least I haven't heard of too much in recent years. But, um, you know, somebody from sort of that whole early 90s, 80s vibe, I think, fits perfectly with Glow. Yeah, she's going to be playing the director at the hotel that the the show is going to be based out of in the third season where they get up and leave for Las Vegas. So the season is uh, coming back on August 9th on Netflix. So that is the big addition. And the final thing here is that All Japan has announced that they're going to be holding a memorial card for Atsushi Aoki, who died last week. Monday at the age of 41 the tribute show will be on August the 11th which is the final uh the the B block final of the G1 the same day on that Sunday uh which is the same day as SummerSlam and that one's going to be taking place from Core Q and Hall and they have announced that Aoki is going to be recognized as their junior heavyweight champion until November the 20th so that will represent 6 months of Aoki as their champion, and then they'll figure out at that point what they're going to do, if they'll hold a tournament for the vacant title. But it seemed like they want to be respectful and keep the title, um, I guess, in his memory for six months and not just um, d- decide what to do with it right away. But there was also a private funeral this past week that was pretty much closed off to just family, with the exception of Junakiyama, Suwama, and his former partner, uh, Hikaru Sato, who was actually going to be facing him um, later this month for the title. They had been scheduled uh, for a match. So um, that is the latest uh, on what All Japan is going to be doing uh, in his member. So the rest of the news you can go find at postwrestling.com. And postwrestling.com, of course, home to so many of our shows. Wade, do you want to give a preview of what is coming up in the days to come? Certainly. Coming out tomorrow is our latest edition of the British Wrestling Experience. Uh, you know, I'm sure uh, Martin, Benno, Jamesy, they'll all be talking a lot about perhaps uh, what's going on right now with uh, the NXT UK Cardiff show uh, coming up, as well as uh, Royal Quest and uh, everything to do with uh, that whole side of the world. We also have the double shot uh, on the cafe where I don't know what I'll be talking about yet. Do you? I I didn't know what I was going to be talking about, so I sat down and I am going to watch the episode of Raw going into Backlash 2004, which we're reviewing on Friday. So I will get everyone up to date what was going on on the Raw brand in April of 2004. Cool. Very cool. That'll be on the cafe feed. Thursday up next are back. They have a big announcement uh, and I don't want to spoil it for everybody. Just uh, just listen in. Up next on Thursday. Friday, Rewind Away, as John mentioned, our latest edition uh, featuring Backlash 2004. Uh, Thursday as well, I forgot to mention, our Cafe Hangout is coming out with Anthony Kingdom James. That'll be available for Double Double Plus patrons and released for free on Friday for everybody else. Our latest edition of the Rocky My Via Picture Show comes out with Nate Milton on Saturday as well. Cruel Summer, Saturday and Sunday, also all on the same feed. So subscribe for all that stuff. And also while we're at it, uh, Way and I, we are going to be doing post-wrestling live in Toronto, Sunday, August the 11th at the John Candy Box Theater at Second City. Uh, 1 p.m. start time, we're going to be doing a Q&A followed by a meet and greet. Tickets are available now, postwrestling.com forward slash live. You can grab them for 25 bucks if you are a member of the Post Wrestling Cafe you get a $5 discount and you can meet us and who knows who else will show up. So looking forward to that into SmackDown. We go from Sacramento, California on Tuesday night at the golden one center, the site of where uh, Uriah Faber is going to be coming out of retirement in about a month. Okay. 
Cool. Yeah, to take on Ricky Simone. Big stuff. Uh, Miz TV started the show, and Miz comes out, and he oh so subtly shows off his new T-shirt, which is a meme of his dad holding up his fists with the caption, My Mood. And Miz said, This is my mood. <laughs> Nothing says cool like WWE merchandise. They really get on trends in a quick fashion and they make it. Man, I, I was just springing for my credit card when I saw this. Are they selling this one? Is this a real shirt? They have to be. What else would this be? It has to be a shirt. Yeah, sure. I mean, somebody will buy it. Someone will. Yeah. There was a, there's a sucker born every minute. Uh, then we had Miz inform us that he's got to follow the script tonight. So he takes out these notes and he reads the show's introduction and then brings out Drew McIntyre, followed by Shane McMahon, who he reads off the, off the script. He's the breast in the world and explains there was a smudge on the paper and calls him the pest of the world. Does that sound right? And this audience is eating this up. They're all cheering. They're like, oh, my God. He's supposed to be saying best in the world. He's saying pest. And I mean, I thought this was such lame stuff, but I can't I can't fault the fact that this landed with this audience like they were they seem to be into this tonight and yesterday. I mean, um, he knows his audience and they know their audience for them is and it it all works. So they had uh, a pretty energetic crowd here at the start of the show. Shane eventually comes out and he's joined by Drew McIntyre and Elias. And Elias starts playing the guitar, leads to You Suck Chance, and Shane informs them that they're all speaking about The Miz when they chant that. Shane got all this heat bragging about beating Roman Reigns, and Miz reminds him about winning one match at WWE World Cup. As I guess it's it's going to forever be referred to as. And he brings up the fact he beat the hell out of Shane at WrestleMania. And then Shane won on a technicality. Then he grated his face against the cage at Money in the Bank and fell out of his shirt. And then turned his direction to Drew McIntyre, calling him the Scottish sycophant, which got partially censored. Sycophant. And I guess maybe he thought he was calling him, um, I don't know, something worse. Sycophant. Um, they replayed the Roman Reigns interview from Byron Saxton and then Drew's time to take over the microphone. He says that he's got something that no one else does. The boomstick, the claymore, and he's going to kick Roman Reigns head off and said he is intense. Or Shane said he is intense and he'll be kicking ass and taking names at stomping grounds. And his name is Roman Reigns. Um, yeah, they're both going to take each other's names. Yeah. What do you think about the boomstick? I'm not sure what that is. They called it this several times on the show. The, they're calling it the Claymore, but it's also got like its own nickname. The Claymore is also the boomstick. Um, like a boom pole? Like what's a boom, like a selfie stick? What is a boomstick? Um... Well, if you if you Google it, it's um it's a kind of lipstick. Boom it's a stick. brand of lipstick. Boomstick trio. Is it, it's it's a weapon as well, isn't it? Right? Uh yes. Okay. For uh, that Bruce Campbell used. Right, yeah, or some type of like nightstick, basically. I feel like we've had this discussion before. I feel like we've talked about boomsticks before. Um so okay, great. Claymore's fine. Yeah. Yep. Uh or maybe it's so, a gun. Ah, whatever. Don't I don't care, everybody. Don't don't tweet me about it. Miz then tells Drew that Shane is going to stab him in the back when he's done with him. So he's warning Drew. Shane uh, nearly screwed up as he went to say that he's two and zero against the Miz. He almost m missed it, but he caught himself and corrected it before. And Miz called him a talentless hack and. Then Shane comes back saying Miz was born into a genetic cesspool that shares the DNA with a baked potato. And then it's set up 
that Shane will allow Miz one more match with him if he can beat Elias and Drew McIntyre tonight. And that's what takes us into our first of many short matches on this show. Um, as the Miz would spend the first 30 minutes on the television screen to start SmackDown. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it just felt like a, a opening segment to Raw, you know, very much uh, the same cast, same vibe, um, kind of rekindling that Shane Miz rivalry for at least another show. Miz and Elias went two and a half minutes. There was a, a flying knee from Elias out of the corner, and then Elias missed an elbow off the top, and Miz hit the skull crushing finale. Very quick match. Yeah. Anything to say about it? No. No. Miz and Drew McIntyre. Drew's shoulder went into the corner. He's on the floor and takes a running drop kick. Shane gets on the apron. Miz is distracted. Glasgow kiss, Claymore, or Boomstick, and pins the Miz in two minutes and seven seconds. So then Shane gets in the ring, and he decides to have a change of heart. Even though the Miz lost to Drew, he's willing to have their match as the Miz is selling the effects of the Claymore. And he has the bell rung, and Shane starts attacking him with punches. Miz fights back. They're cheering. The skull-crushing finale gets blocked with this shitty kick to the head that missed. And then he applies the inverted triangle. And Miz taps out in 42 seconds. And then Drew lifts up Shane, who's got all these bruises up and down his left arm. This looked insane. And that concluded uh, 25% of SmackDown. Mm Mm-hmm. I think um, Shane sitting on Drew's shoulders continues to be a really hilarious heel pose. This large man sitting on top of another large man uh, like he was a child. I think it's great. I'm glad they're keeping that. I feel like <laughs> I understand Shane's the, the guy with the program. Miz isn't. But, man, does Miz look shitty coming out of, like, you know, losing two matches to Shane McMahon. Then he loses two matches here in one night. To Drew McIntyre. And taps, even with the Claymore out, I mean, tapping out to Shane McMahon to that shitty submission. Oh, my God. I just thought it really, really slotted the Miz as such an afterthought after this. Unfortunately. But, you know, yes, I understand the, the program is Roman and Shane at this point. Um, I expected Roman to come out. He did not appear on either Raw or SmackDown. Do you, do you have any idea why? I have. I don't know. Um he was scheduled for the the house show on Monday night, so that's where I assumed he was. And I don't know what the story was tonight uh, of where he was. It was very curious that he wasn't on the show. Um, Mandy Rose and Sonya Deville were in the back, and Ember Moon was like playing on this like gaming device. There's and a switch. they, oh okay, and Mandy and Sonya hand her uh, a stack of the muscle and fitness magazines that Mandy's on the cover of. And then DeVille knocks the switch onto the floor, and Moon's pissed. And as DeVille and Rose walk off, Moon just screams, throwing the magazines, tosses a garbage can, and is just looking like a wolf. That's how you awaken a werewolf, is to drop their Nintendo Switch. That's it. That's that's the, the key to their, their anger. Maybe they, Maybe she cracked the screen or something. You know, maybe it's out of oh. warranty. Like, I'd be pretty pissed about that. Daniel Bryan and Rowan came out, and they announced that they will be taking on the Yolo County Tag Team Champions in a unification match. And there in the corner, AJ Kirsch and Dave Dutra holding these cardboard tag titles. And before the match could begin... Heavy Machinery came out, stating that the champions are ducking their challenge, they are elitist cowards, and they are blue-collar solid, and would become the universe's tag team champions. And then Brian and Rowan said, well, first, you have to beat the YOLOs. I didn't know YOLO County was a real thing, but evidently it is. I think it's a great name for a county. And seeing AJ Kirsch here was a real pleasant surprise. You're a doppelganger. My doppelganger, yes, AJ Kirsch. Um, so we had another quick match here. Um, Phillips identified uh, Dutra as whoever this guy is, and they hit him with the Caterpillar. Tucker pressed him into Otis, Slam, Compactor, and they won in a minute three. I thought it was a pretty good reintroduction for Heavy Machinery. I think with um, 
Super Showdown out of the way. We're seeing a lot more neglected talent over the past several months getting a bit of airtime on this show. So uh, we await to see what the actual program is, what what Daniel Bryan can do promo-wise with Otis and Tucker. Yeah, I'm re- I'm reserving judgment because I, I think that Bryan's kind of been on the back burner as they built up Super Showdown, but I, I do wonder when we're talking about kind of the some of the depth on top, it's like, is this is this the best use of Daniel Bryan? Like, I enjoy him in this tag division, but is it the best use of this guy feuding with Otis and Tucker? Yeah, I mean, I really do like the idea of him trying to elevate the tag team belts, but um, the problem is, you know, who are the opponents in that division? And if it's just the level of guys like Otis and Tucker, maybe you can argue he's better served as a as a single star. Our truth and Carmelo were backstage. Uh, Our truth is recapping how he lost the title on the tarmac to Jinder, won it back on the flight, then got trapped on an elevator on Monday, and the 7-Eleven title is ruining his life, but he can't let it go. And he goes to hide in this, uh, into this production trunk, and it gets locked, and Carmella has to leave because she has a match coming up, and our truth is suffocating inside of this box. Yeah, he's complaining that he can't breathe. I thought Carmella came off really shitty here. I thought so too. She you, she might be charged for manslaughter. So Jinder Mahal walks by, can hear Truth screaming, and then, oh, this this was terrible comedy. He pretended to be Carmella by disguising his voice, and he's screaming that he only has two breaths left. And Jinder goes off to find a crowbar, but what he's really doing is going to find a referee, which apparently took like twenty five minutes to find, and would come back later on. Right, yeah. I mean, I don't know how really funny this was, but I think that, you know, to an audience that really likes the Miz's comedy, I felt like this was probably in line and probably worked for a number of people. Well, that's uh, you did qualify it. Sonya Deville and Carmella, uh, we had a running knee strike by Deville and then went for a jackknife cover that was turned into the Code of Silence, which Rose ended up putting Deville's leg onto the rope. Carmella then chased Rose into the ring, got cut off, cradle for a two count. Then DeVille spills to the floor and Carmella dives to the floor onto both, taking them out, super kicks Mandy. And then back into the ring, there's a step up knee that Carmella walks right into and gets stacked for the cover. Sonya DeVille wins in 354. It was nice to see DeVille in a singles match. I think she's she's decent, but I, I don't know if she's... She really left much much of an impression. Nor do I really think she she was supposed to. I guess. Um, I guess right now she just kind of feels like you know very much uh, mid tier without much of a storyline attached to her. Uh, unless it's Ember, but maybe the program is at what Ember Mandy, or she's going to need a partner. Right. So maybe Carmella fits in there somewhere. Yeah. I thought I thought Carmella's dive looked good. Yeah. Alexa Bliss is in the back drinking coffee. And she's scrolling on her phone. Nikki Cross walks in. These two just popped up from Raw, our big wild card. And Bliss informs her that after Nikki Cross cost them cost Bailey the match on Monday, Bailey went on social media and said a lot of hurtful things about Nikki Cross and Bailey also liked one of the comments and Alexa says I would show you but I have Bailey blocked and then she goes over the names that Nikki Cross was called and they end up setting up a match with Nikki Cross and Bailey for later tonight with Alexa Bliss pretty much just setting up Nikki Cross to go out and treat Bailey like one of the many bullies that have called her names all her life and tells her not to hold back against Bailey. So Alexa Bliss manipulating the vulnerable Nikki Cross. Through the use of social media even. Does Nikki Cross not have Twitter? Can she just not go on Bailey's timeline? She, absolute, she absolutely has Twitter, but not in not in this realm. Got it. Okay. Um, yeah, you know, I think this is all in decent shape. Um it feels like um, perhaps, you know, one of the benefits of this wild card is that we get to see the same programs um, 
get somewhat accelerated by seeing them both on Mondays and Tuesdays. In some cases, I feel like it's just a retread, but here, I feel like we're, you're getting some development between Monday and Tuesday. So the New Day came out for their big return, and they said it's the actual return of Big E. And says if Big E says if he had a title for every return, he'd be Charlotte Flair. And Kofi laughs, saying, that's a booking joke. Wood said he just wants to get through tonight's match so he can get back to E3. And then talked about Sam Zayn and mentions that Kofi Kingston has beaten all three of their opponents tonight. So we're going to beat them collectively. Dolph came out, called Kofi a coward, and he betrayed himself. The only reason he's still champion is because of Xavier Woods, who has nowhere to run or hide at stomping grounds. And the world will know, without his friends and taking the easy way out, he can't beat Ziggler. Then he gets joined by Owens and Zayn, and the people don't care about justice. They have no morals, says Zayn. They have no ethical code. He runs down the New Day, and then the New Day laugh about Seth Rollins' attack on Sami Zayn with the chair last night. And it ends with Big E cutting a big promo, saying Kofi is willing to walk through fire to prove he's the best at what he does. And Kofi says at stomping grounds, the time will come to kick ass and take names. And the name is Dolph Ziggler. Yeah, I, I better see a lot of names like on their shirts or something like the day after stomping grounds. I want to see them like have a handful of names come the Raw or SmackDown after st- stomping grounds. All six here sounded very good. You know, they're, they're six very talented people uh, that all can deliver on the microphone. So, yeah, a fine little back and forth. Kayla then interviewed Bailey, and she said that the allegations of liking offensive tweets, she was asked about the allegations of liking these offensive tweets directed at Nikki Cross. Bailey says, I don't have anything against Nikki Cross. I was going to say, this could be easily provable if this was true, but Bailey didn't seem to really care. Bliss, she said, can watch tonight, and it'll be a moment that she won't forget what she does to Nikki Cross. Alistair Black is still in his room, and he noted that for the men and women of SmackDown, there is so much conflict, yet so little resolution. And he offers both. It's so simple. You can make conflict with me, and then I will fight you. We don't have to fight over trivial things like the love of another man or woman, or fight over turf. And then he acknowledges someone who has clearly shown up in the room to open the door for him. I guess there are production people. You know, you need camera people. You probably need a, a producer to oversee this. They don't want. They don't want to raise conflict. Has that been established? They don't want to fight Alistair Black. I don't think so. No. So then, this person opens the door. Light shines in, and in the most comedic moment of the night, he screams at the top of his lungs, "The door is wide open." And he yells for a fight. And then he grabs his chest. I thought he was having a heart attack. I didn't know what, dude, I didn't know what was going on here. Maybe he should walk out the door and go find a fight. I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? You know what? Whatever. I I, I found this week, I thought the verbiage was fine, but I thought the whole screaming out, out the door thing was pretty terrible. He's now just kind of being reduced to like the crazy screaming guy who, you know, talks to himself inside a room and locks himself he's just he's just a weirdo now rather than the guy who you know kicks people's heads off so i feel like the the, these segments have definitely overstayed their welcome um just have him come out and fight i think we're at that time right now this is not this is not the firefly funhouse no bailey versus nikki cross uh they had a decent match here Uh, Byron brought up that he thinks there's a bit of manipulation going on between Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross. Corey Graves just buried social media. I love this. Um, Bailey got caught in the ring skirt and was attacked. Bailey then got placed in the tree of woe. Bliss was making fun of her. And then Bailey went after Alexa Bliss on the apron, allowing Nikki Cross to get a cradle. And then Bailey hit a running knee, top rope elbow, pins Nikki Cross, and stared at Alexa Bliss, who had her plan thwarted by Bailey. Yeah. Um, somewhat rehabs Bailey for last night. Um, uh, that's really it. Wait, 
your analysis there, that was his whole show for me. Like, I just felt like this show was, um, like, there was some stuff that I, I, I got a kick out of. But this really just felt like a show that we're at the end of a long stretch this weekend, and we got two hours. And then we're done. It was a pretty by-the-numbers show, and I would say pretty low on star power at that. Um, I wouldn't say there was anything that offensive about it, but nothing that memorable either. Yeah, I I was not offended, um, but I was not captivated either. Uh, Jinder has now found a referee, and he goes back, and the the box is gone, and he goes over to a production guy, and the boxes are getting shipped to L.A. for Raw. And he just instantly says, we got to go to L.A. And then as he takes off with the referee for L.A., we hear our truth screaming inside of the box while Carmella is still looking for him. Yes, yeah, so he will be without Carmella, uh, perhaps on Monday. I think this type of, you know, like, like, um, ridiculousness is perfectly acceptable for the 24 seven championship. So, you know, our truth is uh, theoretically going to be stuck in this box All for week. six days without oxygen, without food. Um, so I expect to see him come back out, maybe a different man. You couldn't you couldn't survive in this box for six days. Well, in this division, you can. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, maybe maybe we'll get daily updates on YouTube of of our truth. Maybe there is a maybe he's got his phone with good Wi Fi. Yeah, bars. Kayla interviewed Apollo Cruz, and they showed the highlights of last week when he was supposed to face Andrade, and the match never happened. So. Uh, he got attacked and hit with the hammerlock DDT, and he explained, I am not an afterthought. Uh, he's been everything that defines an afterthought. Zelina Vega walks in and says Andrade was in a bad mood after Super Showdown and the loss to Finn Balor. You should not provoke him, or he'll make sure Apollo Crews never has a match again. And Apollo came back and said, who are you, my employer? Hmm. <laughs> And then off to the side was Chad Gable taking notes for whatever he's doing. Wrestling podcast. <laughs> That's what I thought here. I'm like, he's not taking notes on like this guy in the ring. He's like writing down his promo. Yeah. So we'll see what, what, what happens with Chad Gable and Apollo Crews. And then the main event, New Day against Dolph Ziggler, Sami Zayn, and Kevin Owens. Phillips, I love this. He did not have to bring this up, but just decided to. He said that this week on SmackDown, we violated the wild card rule again. Guess you can blame Shane McMahon. <laughs> so how many people? I counted five. We had Drew McIntyre, The Miz, Sami Zayn, Alexa Bliss, and Nikki Cross. Okay. And I don't know if there were any more, but there were at least five. Okay. But no one would have called them on this if Phillips hadn't brought it up. So I just found it entertaining that they actually did bring up this this number that they introduced the first week, and they don't give a shit about this number. Mm -hmm. Lance Storm, I think, had the the best solution to this. Why can't we just unify the titles and they are the wild cards? Um. Yeah. Sure. I don't know if it would be better, but yeah, sure. I guess the theory being. This is really instead of the wild card rule, it's more so the Roman Reigns rule. Yeah. And you want him on both shows. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't have a title. Um, they did the unicorn stampede on Zayn. Owens hit a senton to Kofi on the floor to set up one commercial. Woods got the tag, got knocked off balance off the top, so the heat on Woods for a long period of time. And then Owens went for this moonsault, and Woods was supposed to roll out of the way, but Owens landed on his back, so... I think they just improvised this and went to the DDT spot because it was to set up Woods then making the hot tag uh, to get Big E in, who hit all these belly-to-bellies to Ziggler. Ziggler missed a Famouser. And then for the third time in two nights, we got the blind tag spot with Sami Zayn this time. Ziggler misses, super kicks his partner, then super kicks Woods. Kofi's in, trouble in paradise to Ziggler, and then a trouble in paradise to Zayn to pin him and then the show. Well, I mean, it's not an exciting tag team match without a blind tag, right? Um, I just thought it was somewhat formulaic, as was this entire match. It was a basic match uh, with a lot of tag team, I don't know, tropes. I kind of found it a little dead for much of it. 
like when Woods was in there. I thought they really got back up there for a co- uh, Big E's reappearance and then, you know, right into the finish. I thought it ended up being fine, but again, um, a pretty unmemorable match and show overall. I completely agree. I thought this was two hours that, man, you did not have to go out of your way to see. Uh, I thought they did something different tonight by doing a lot of short matches, so you didn't have... I, I don't know if that was just something they were trying out this week, um, because it was really only the last two matches where they even inserted a commercial break, but I didn't think there was a lot of great wrestling on this show. I didn't think that there was... Uh, the comedy really didn't hit for me, and it just felt like a show that... It, it just felt like this was like the end of a very long couple of days with the Saudi Arabia show, Raw on Monday, house shows on Sunday, and just finishing up and getting these these two hours done. Like I'm sure this is an exhausted crew. Yeah. But that's that's kind of what this show felt like. Um the just the end of the road for for this week. I know it might not be what they're looking for, you know, in terms of ratings and all that, but I really do want to see more fresh faces on this show. I want to see more guys get opportunities to become kind of that next, you know, at least a mid tier star because, you know, there are a ton of them waiting in the back. I want to see guys get real storylines. And I'm just thinking to, like, what SmackDown was perhaps a year ago after the... Um, like, even SmackDown and its... Uh, uh, all of its incarnations. I, I felt like SmackDown was always a, a real breath of fresh air um, with good, uh, a great roster of talent. I think uh, fresh faces, or at least fresh p- faces on top. Um, and now it just... It just feels like a watered down version of Raw often. Yeah, I, I think that this. I think you got to get Aleister Black in there. I, I think that you know, just an Aleister Black match in there. There's no Finn Balor this week. There's no. I mean, Buddy Murphy is. God knows where he's gone. Yeah, there are those guys that you could um, be integrating a bit more because I I just found 30 minutes to start the show built around the Miz. I was just kind of checked out after that. That was a long time to start the show. And it's not like the wrestling was really captivating either. That was opening the show. So that was SmackDown. What do you give this show? Um, Maybe a five. The forum voted a 5.2 for SmackDown, getting a higher rating than Raw on Monday night. Brandon from Oshawa writes... I may get a lot of hate for this, but I really think Shane McMahon should challenge Kofi for the WWE title at the first SmackDown on Fox. We complain a lot about 50-50 booking and no one looking strong, but Shane is by far the top heel in the company right now. He hasn't lost a singles match in nearly two years. That's crazy. (laughs) Is he the ideal person you want in this position? Of course not. But this is how things have been booked. I think he should get the title shot and win the championship with the help from a big E turn. Brock should then cash in on Shane a few weeks later and do a build for Brock Big E at next year's WrestleMania. I know most won't go for this, but I'm really enjoying Shane right now, and I think this could be an entertaining story. I still think it's too soon. I I mean, the New Day just work right now as a trio, and... I'm not really feeling it. I don't don't dislike the role Shane is in, uh, but... That to me is is several steps way too far, and it's not like this revolutionary idea that a guy could be built up with a lot of wins for a long time. It should not be Shane McMahon uh, that you could do a similar story with. I would love for them to just pick pick any guy off the roster and just say, we're going with this guy. He's going to challenge for the title in three months, and we're going to make him look unstoppable for three months. I'd be so happy with that. Anyone. Mm-hmm. Even as as crazy as it sounds, if they just stuck with like, we're pushing Baron Corbin, and we're going to make him look unstoppable for three months. It's like wouldn't be my guy that I pick, but I can at least get behind that you're going with this guy and book him to be as strong as possible to be that threat. Instead of ah, uh, we we go with him this week, then the next week he loses, and we just go back and forth, and you just have indifference for a lot of these guys instead of just making someone super hot or at least attempting to that he is separated from the pack it's not everybody just trades wins and losses it's we have this tier of guys that go unbeaten and then they lose the big title match at the end and then we find the next guy in line yeah 
We go to Paul from New Jersey who says, I don't think Mrs. Dad will be proud of that springboard attempt. I'm glad Bailey went over clean while staring Alexa down. It's sad that I'm excited when WWE gets basic booking decisions. Speaking of which, it's okay, everyone. Phillips, Phillips explained five Raw competitors were on tonight's show because of an oversight by Shane. Still, <laughs> not a terrible show. Raptors in seven. P.S. As Black was screaming, fight me out an open door, the shot quickly bled into Bailey smiling, music blaring <laughs> loudly. A friend and I proceeded to burst out laughing. Thing. I don't know why it was just a very funny transition. Yeah, that is funny. I didn't catch that. All right. Uh, MJ writes, uh, I must say, Wei Ting is a huge draw in this business. We have posters on the forum who have posted in a year coming out for the Wei Ting debate. You guys are Patreon saints delivering high quality discussion night after night. Uh, well, thank you very much, MJ. He goes on to say some random tidbits. Uh, New G- okay, this isn't really SmackDown feedback. This is more so just general feedback. Do you want Do you want me to go through this? Sure, why not? It's a light show. He says about New Japan uh, with the Takeover Kenta shirt, and then the tweet about Mondays. Welcome to the dump on WWE party. I mean, in fairness, Takeover, yes, it is like the. I think obviously people can connect it to, but that is a Shibata shirt that he was wearing with the connection there. They're um, a tag team. Yeah. So that's going to be like his, um, you know, Shibata is going to be his his guy. Um, Hunter really going to – is Hunter really going to go to Japan to team with AJ and the club right before Gallows and Anderson leave? Unreal. These guys are gold on their podcast, and they're going to have some must-listen-to good brother shit soon as they get out of jail. Why antagonize them? Goes on to – that's in relation to um, WWE going to Sumo Hall for – uh, June 29th and 30th, I believe, and Hunter's teaming with AJ Gallows and Anderson in an eight-man tag on the first night there. I, I mean, I don't see it as antagonizing them. Do you? Like, they're they're probably going to be featured in the main event. No, it's uh, – man, it's a prominent match for Gallows and Anderson that they would not be getting if not for their history. Um, yeah. And Hunter's going to get all the – this is like Hunter's going to be in the Bullet Club for one night. Pretty much, yeah. Uh, he says um, they are offering five-year deals no, to a, new a, a hypothetical. A hypothetical. Um, okay, right. Um, of an NXT signee. Okay, if they're offering a five-year deal, uh, would would you accept that? Um, just if you were a wrestler coming up, I would say no. I would I would say signing a five-year deal to go to NXT right now. Um, Regardless of whether you could springboard to the main roster quick, I think that's far from a guarantee. And I just, in this marketplace, I would not want to lock myself up to that amount of term. I think that's too long. I wouldn't either. Uh, five years is a long time. Yeah. Um, he adds, with Kenta debuting in New Japan, it got me thinking how incredible a return of Nakamura would be. What would be bigger for New Japan than that in the next 18 months? Um, the Rock. Yeah, the rock. Um well, I would say that uh Nakamura going back would it would be big, um but I don't see that happening. Maybe eventually, but uh not now. Yeah. I could see him doing like a farewell tour when he's ready to like hang it up, but I don't see that anytime soon. I think he's just gonna stay put in, in WWE in whatever he's doing right now. Mm-hmm. We got a Long Island Joe who says some random thoughts. I really liked what they did with Aleister Black tonight. His promos needed to change, and I like what they did. I like that Kofi is more serious, even in New Day mode. I'm starting to feel like he needs a long title run, and then maybe have Orton take the title off of him eventually for one last run, leading to Black taking it off of him. Firefly Funhouse took a good turn tonight. I barely watched Raw last night and missed it. I've enjoyed most of them so far. I'm just worried about when he debuts in ring. What do you guys think about him wrestling as his Firefly character most of the time and occasionally using the mask? Or is that too much like Finn with the demon? Uh, it is similar, but I, I think that's where everyone looks at this Bray character as having um, the biggest adjustment to make is integrating this into WWE programming and not just having its own island on the show that's been successful so far. So um, I'm not optimistic on it. I think that's going to be a real challenge. So. I'll wait and see, though. Maybe they will have a great execution plan because obviously a lot of thought has gone into this. This is not some just throwaway character. It's They've invested a lot in it, so I hope that they have something mapped out for it. Mm-hmm. 
And the final one is Brandon. Greetings, bro adjacent. I have returned. Been some time since we spoke. I'm really enjoying the Shane run. I wish he would be more of a manager than a wrestler because he gasses out quicker than Conan in his run in 99. Other than that, nothing memorable. Well, other than Dolph complaining and Gable looking like a favorite to win the best of the Super Juniors next year, his match with Gentleman Jack on 205 dead. He adds, do you think that Abushi used some of... Okay. I'm not in the meanderings mood right now, so I'm sorry, Brandon. All right. <laughs> I can't. Um, but thank you anyway for the feedback to you and to everyone. Forum.postwrestling.com is where you can uh, always throw up your feedback after Raw and SmackDown. And Way and I are going to be back Wednesday night. We've got the double shot. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm going to go through the episode of Raw leading into Backlash 2004, which is this week's review for Rewind Away. So you can tune into that on Friday if you're a member of the cafe and get all caught up to date on WWE 2004. Uh, I, I look forward to hearing about that. And I guess that's it. Is there anything to uh, conclude with, Way? What, what do you think you're going to watch over the next day? Or is it just going to be a blank slate tomorrow I mean, I, and you'll find something? Yeah, I mean, I really don't know. Is, is there anything people want us to review uh, on top of, you know, all the other stuff that we're doing? Uh, let me know. Let me know. We'll, we'll find something. Don't worry. Uh, so that'll be up Wednesday night. And then of course, all of our shows you can find up there at postwrestling.com and of course, postwrestlingcafe.com. So that is it. We will speak with uh, you on Wednesday night and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>